here today. Perfect. And so I'm a computational biochemist from Uppsala University. I'm originally trained as an organic chemist and basically interested in catalysis in all its forms. But uh, in recent years, we've been focusing more and more on biological catalysis, and in particular using simulation tools to try to understand the evolution of enzyme function. And so one of the things that's come out from a lot of our work is that conformational dynamics is really important, which is what I'll talk to you about today. And as uh, Richard mentioned, so the main focus of my talk is to give you examples of conformational dynamics and natural enzyme evolution, and then to show you how it can be used to generate proficient camp eliminase activity on a precambrian enzyme scaffold. And just before I start, Richard, if you could do me a favor, when I have the PowerPoint on, I have no idea of the time. So I'm going to do my best to keep time, but if I'm starting to run late, would you please give me a heads up? Yeah, I'll send you, um, I'll send you a message in the chat five minutes before time is up. Perfect, thank you so much. And so before I start, I'd like to actually dedicate this talk to a dear friend, colleague and mentor of mine, Dan Taufik, who passed away recently in a really tragic accident. And so Danny was probably one of the smartest people I've ever met, and he was the giant of protein evolution. His uh, contributions to this field have been uh, more than anyone could possibly count. And he's played a spectacular role in shaping the way I think about enzymes, how they work and how they evolve. And so pretty much all aspects of the talk I'm going to give today has somehow been touched on by Danny, so it's uh, really been a great tragedy, both personally and for the field. And so just giving you an overview of the kind of things we do in my group. So again, as I said, I started out for my PhD as a theoretical organic chemist working with small molecules. But over time, we've gone to bigger and bigger molecules, the largest being uh, LACI dimer on DNA. And so we're using enhanced sampling. So we're looking at conformational sampling of biomolecular systems, looking at uh, atomic details of enzyme substrate interactions, looking at free energy landscapes for enzymatic and non-enzymatic reactions, and uh, more recently also looking at LSD steric signaling pathways. And we use a wide range of tools to do this from quantum chemical calculations of uh, non-enzymatic model systems, multi-scale modeling using typically empirical valence bond and QMM calculations of uh, enzymatic reactions, various types of enhanced sampling approaches to look at conformational dynamics, and then various types of structural bioinformatics approaches for the subsequent analysis. And while this is typically done using state-of-the-art approaches, where necessary, we also do method development. And I'm a big fan of open science. So apart from this web server, uh, web server MySol maker, everything is available on GitHub or on relevant web pages. And so we've been describing classical models for uh, describing metal, sorry, developing classical models for describing challenging metal ions in uh, biomolecular systems, although we've used our models also for water oxidation catalyst. We developed with Johan Opfis in-house the Q6 simulation package, which is available on the free software license on GitHub. We have a toolkit caddy for computer-aided directed evolution of enzymes. And if you want micelles for your simulations, so we have a web server micelle maker that will generate simulation-ready micelles for you. And so for the interest of time, that's basically all I'm going to say about methods. I'm going to focus on applications and what you can learn using these different types of methods. But of course, if anyone is interested in the specific methodology, then I'm more than happy to discuss with you later in the Q&A and after. And so, as I said, we've been trying to understand how proteins evolve, and something that keeps coming out of the studies of both ourselves and others is that conformational dynamics seems to play a really important role in uh, both the evolution of natural enzymes, but also when you're studying retroactively direct evolution trajectories, typically conformational dynamics and modulating this was a really important factor. And uh, as pointed out in a review by Colin Jackson, it seems to be a twofold effect. And so on the one hand, if you have greater conformational dynamics, you're going to expand the conformational ensemble of your enzyme. And so you're going to sample more conformations and some of which can do new chemistries. And, but on the other hand, of course, you're also going to sample more non-productive conformations. So, so if you sort of imagine a kind of a triangle, so first you expand the conformational ensemble. And then once you have a new conformation that you like, then you re-optimize for that new confirmation. And we've seen this in so many different systems. So, so looking at side chain cooperativity and alkaline phosphatases, we've uh, seen it a lot in the selectivity of organophosphate hydrolases, reactive site loop dynamics, and also the flexibility of the scaffold itself seems to be really important. 
we've been looking at a lot of design camp eliminators where we actually see active site shuffling, complete redesign of the active sites by laboratory evolution and evolution confirmation and selection, stabilizing new confirmations. And more recently, we've also been looking at the de novo emergence of enzyme function scaffolds that are non-catalytic. And even there, both substrate and side chain dynamics plays an important role. And so, of course, in the interest of time, I can't go through all these examples, but what I'm going to do is to focus on two systems. First, I'm going to talk to you a bit about protein tyrosine phosphatases as a model system where conformational dynamics is really important to evolution. And then I'm going to show you how these insights about conformational dynamics can be used to generate anthropogenic camp eliminase activity. And my hope is that even with these two systems, I'll be able to convince you by the end of this talk that regulating conformational dynamics seems to be critical for both natural and engineered evolvability. So if we start with PTPs, so PTPs are a large family of regulatory enzymes. So they control a whole host of cellular processes, of course, uh, signaling primarily. And uh, as a result of this, they're major drug targets, uh, in particular for treating cancer, type 2 diabetes, and obesity. And so if you look at PTPs, they operate in a broad range of biological contexts, but if you compare them, they tend to have conserved core regions. And in particular, what's highly conserved is the phosphate binding P loop, which binds the phosphate substrate. And also there are a number of mobile loops, but the most important of the, these is this WPD loop. So the sequence of the WPD loop varies a lot, but it's named after the highly conserved WPD near the center of the loop. And so upon substrate binding, this loop undergoes a large conformational change around seven to nine angstrom from an open to closed conformation over the active site. But what's significant about this loop closure is that typically when you look at enzyme loops, you think of them as a lid that closes over the active site and sequesters the active site from solvent. But actually in the context of this WPD loop, even when the loop closes over the active site, the substrate is actually able to bind and unbind from the site. So it's not so much a lid per se, but rather what's curious about the WPD loop is that it carries a key catalytic residue on aspartic acid side chain, and it positions this into the active site where it can act as an acid base cat uh, catalyst in a two-step ping pong cleavage hydrolysis mechanism catalyzed by all these enzymes. And so what stands out with these enzymes is that, as I said, the core they have in common, the WPD loop and P loop they have in common, they all use the same catalytic mechanism and have very similar transition states. And yet the rates of members of the PTP superfamily can vary by many orders of magnitude. And that in itself is not surprising that it varies because, of course, they operate in different biological contexts and as regulatory enzymes, fine tuning the turnover number is really important. But then how do they achieve this? And obviously modulating loop dynamics would be much easier than reinventing the wheel and put, doing new chemistry or putting in new catalytic residues in different biological contexts. And so there's also NMR data that suggests the timescales of uh, WPD loop motion and the chemical step are correlated. And so we set out to see if this is the case. We're studying a lot of different PTPs in my group, but in our preliminary work, the goal was to focus on two protein tyrosine phosphatases, PTP1B, which is a human enzyme, and the OPH from Yersinia pestis. And so basically, these are two of the best characterized PTPs, and notably EOPH is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the most efficient PTP yet characterized. And uh, it's uh, both about an order of magnitude uh, faster turnover number than PTP1B, but also the WPD loop is more flexible and undergoes faster transitions. And so as our starting point, there are a ton of crystal structures of especially PTP1B, but also several of your page with WPD loop and loop open conformations, loop closed conformations with uh, ligands bound to the active site, so without ligands bound to the active site. And so we did separate principal component analysis on PTP1B and your page. And what you see here are projections along the first principal component, PC1. So this is still analysis of static structures, but PC1 accounts for basically most of the variance. And what you see is uh, also that this is basically just describing WPD loop opening and closing. And if you then look at the relative mobility of the individual WPD loop residues along this PC, you see that the peak mobility is close to the WPD near the center of the WPD loop. But what's interesting is that while your page samples a monomodal uh, distribution of mobilities, then PTP1B, you have a bimodal distribution with a second smaller peak closer to the C-terminal region of the loop. And if you look at the residues here, so again, remember, it's mainly the WPD loop, the WPD residues that are conserved in this loop. 
So the residues forming this peak in PTP1b are flanked by protein residues, which of course you'd expect to rigidify this region of the loop, whereas in your page they're not. And so then the question is, is the difference in mobility partially due to the second peak in these proline residues in the loop? But of course, this is just analysis of static structures. And so we then also did Hamiltonian replica exchange molecular dynamic simulations of PTP1B and YOPH. These are snapshots from our HREX-MD simulations of the respective WPD loops colored according to RMSF. And what you can see is that the your page WPD loop consistently with experiments samples both larger conformational space and also is more flexible than the PTP1B WPD loop. We projected histograms uh, onto the first uh, two principal components from our PCA, from PCA analysis on these HREX MD simulations. And then the gray dots here are the crystal structures for each system that are available. And so what you see is that we sample both open and closed conformations in both systems. But what was quite intriguing to us is that in the case of your page, but not in the case of PTP1B, we sample the canonical open conformation, but we sample this additional hyper open conformation with the loop that's, really, that's flung really wide open. And so obviously this is not a catalytically active conformation because the spartic acid is way too far from the active site. But uh, what's curious with this conformation is that even though you don't observe it in crystal structures of wild, wild type your page, you do observe it in chimeric structures where some or all of the WPD loop of PTP1B is being grafted onto the your page scaffold. And in addition, there are at least two other unrelated PTPs where there are crystal structures of the WPD loop in this uh, wide open conformation. And so here in the well type, we sample it very, very rarely. So this is only about 1% of simulation time, but there seems to be at least some intrinsic tendency of your page to be able to sample this hyperconformation. And the fact that you do see it elsewhere and also in unrelated PTPs, since allosteric regulation is really important for these enzymes. So that points to the likelihood that even if it's not a catalytically important conformation, it has some sort of casual, uh, sorry, some sort of functional importance. It's not a casually sampled conformation. And so if you then look at the helicity of the helix of the WPD loop and adjacent residues, what you see in the uh, hyper open conformation is that the alpha helix adjacent to the C thermal region of the WPD loop is actually extended in these hyper open conformations of uh, your page and you can see some interactions responsible for stabilizing this. And with the extended helix, if you can sort of like visualize this, it's basically tugging on the loop and helping it fly wide open. And then if we come back to the prolines, at least one of which I commented on in the PCA analysis. So there's this proline that's present in PTP1B, which cannot sample a hyperconformation, but not present in your page. And if you look at the percentage helical content, content of each of these residues, you see that this proline seems to be acting as a helix breaker. So again, this bimodal distributional mobility is this uh, proline basically sitting there. And so that's a clear difference between the two enzymes. Now, HREX is wonderful, but it's not so great for sampling multiple transitions between loop conformations. We've had similar problems also with triose phosphate isomerase, and it's not so great in this context. We're also looking at the relative free energies of the loop states. So we went to more advanced enhanced sampling simulations, in this case, parallel tempering metadynamics. And so one thing to bear in mind with, with uh, these simulations, so these are now projected free energy landscapes for the loop dynamics in the unligandered forms of PTP1B and your page, as well as in the PN, uh, paranitrophenyl phosphate PNPP band Michaelis complex and the resulting phosphate intermediates after the cleavage. And we use multiple collective variables, uh, including delta RMSD native context of so the close conformation and several distances to describe uh, the loop motion. But the key thing is that you should take these absolute energies with a grain of salt, because they're also highly dependent on what collective variables you use and how you define the loop motion. But at least the relative values can give you some insight. And so from these simulations, you see that in the unligandered form in both PTP1B and in your page, the open conformation is energetically favored over the corresponding closed conformation. But the energy difference is slightly smaller in your page than in PTP1B, uh, consistent with the faster transitions of the your page loop. Now, as soon as you bind the ligand, you reverse this presumably because you then also have interactions with the phosphodiene group of the ligand and the of the substrate in the resulting intermediate. And so the energies are either in favor of the closed conformation or really similar. And within the resolution of these calculations, you can't really tell the difference between these states. Now that's in pretty good agreement with what you'd expect experimentally, but then of course the question is why? And why do you have, 
why do you prefer a WPD loop close conformation when you have a ligand bound? And also, uh, why is this loop motion uh, easier in your patient than in PTP1B? And so again, part of this is, as I mentioned, interactions between the WPD loop and the phosphodiion of the bound ligand, which is unsurprising. But what was kind of cool was actually that there seems to be a second interaction with an adjacent loop, the E loop. And so the E loop, uh, uh, you have this uh, bridging interaction between a glutamic acid side chain on the E loop, E115, and an arginine not on the WPD loop, but on the phosphate binding P loop in the active site. And this salt bridge is highly conserved among PTPs. And this interaction essentially serves two purposes. So one is a positioning effect. So you basically position the arginine to interact with the phosphodiion of the bound substrate. But the second issue is that you have this bulky arginine sitting in the active site. And when the arginine is there, then it's much harder for the WPD loop to close over this arginine. And so when you form a salt bridge with this glutamic acid, it also kind of positions the arginine a bit out of the way. And so it's much easier than for the WBD loop to close over the active site. And so if you look at normalized frequencies of uh, how much the salt bridge is maintained in our metadynamic simulations, what you see is that in both PTP1B and in uh, your page, when you have a ligand bound, you see a greater occurrence of the salt bridge, and you see this uh, much more in all three states for your page than you do in PTP1B. If you look at the flexibility of the e-loop that this uh, side chain is on, then if you look at the RMSF of the e-loop residues, you see that in PTP1B, you have a more rigid e-loop uh, when there's a ligand bound than in the unligand form. And then your page is just more rigid in all three cases. And then if you look again at snapshots of the conformational space sampled by uh, the e-loop in our metadynamic simulations, you see the exact opposite of what we saw in the case of the WPD loop. So in the case of the WPD loop, we saw a more flexible WPD loop sampling larger conformational space in your page than in PTP1B. And here, the same is true for the E loop, but in PTP1B rather than in your page. And if you sort of imagine this as a sort of CISO effect, so obviously you want to have a rigid uh, E loop so you can pull the arginine out of the way and let the WPD loop close. So the more floppy the E loop, then uh, basically the harder it is for the WPD loop to close over the active sites. And just doing dynamic cross-correlation matrix analysis suggests also that the motion of the E loop and the WPD loops are concerted. And then looking at the stability of paranitrophenyl phosphate in the Michaelis complex, also the OPH active site seems to be more pre-organized uh, than the PTP1B active site. And so this is, of course, something that would be fairly hard to establish from experiments alone. So it's also an example of the kind of insights that simulations can provide. But it's very clear that there are differences in the dynamics of not just the WPD loop, but other catalytic loops that are relevant uh, between PTP1B and your page. Now, we also wanted to look at the chemistry, and we did empirical valence bond simulations of the cleavage and hydrolysis steps in PTP1B and your page. And in this case, uh, the rate limiting step is the second hydrolysis step. And there, there's about an order of magnitude difference in rate between PTP1B and your page. Whereas from our calculations, we actually get very similar activation free energies. There's a small difference, but not as large as what you'd expect experimentally. Now, in and of itself, this is perhaps unsurprising, because if you compare the active sites of PTP1B and your page, you have very similar residues. They're making very uh, similar catalytic contributions. Um, the transition states are geometric there's some slight differences in bond order, but this is basically key stationary points for PTP1B, and the transition states for the cleavage and hydrolysis steps, and the problem slight differences in distance and bond order, they look exactly the same for your page. So the active sites are not identical, but pretty close to, and so it's unsurprising you then don't see huge differences in chemistry, but this further hammers home this idea that it really is the differences in loop dynamics, and again, since you have several orders of magnitude difference uh, amongst the different PTPs, this is probably something that's being modulated across the whole superfamily and not just in these two enzymes. Worth mentioning, though, when looking at the residue contributions, there seem to be fairly catalytically important residues also on the e-loop. So it's not just a conformational effect, but also an electrostatic effect from this uh, additional mobile loop. So then, again, I want to mainly talk about engineering in the context of camp eliminases, but the question is, can you predict mutations that will shift the population of this WPD loop uh, to a loop close conformation, even in the unligand form of the enzyme? And so the kinetic scheme, of course, is fairly complex because you have a multi-step ping pong reaction, and along the way, you also have equilibria between the open and closed states of the WPD loop. 
But what's interesting is if you look at the WPD loops, uh, you have a glycine on the WPD loop of your page, whereas you have a threonine in the corresponding position on the WPD loop of PTP1B. And if you basically swap these residues for each other, so G352T in your page and T177G in PTP1B, so these are crystal structures of wild type and mutant enzymes overlaying on each other in complex with ligand. And you see in the close conformation, there's essentially no difference between, or there are very minor differences. So, so you adopt the same close conformation as you do the wild type enzyme. But what's interesting is the conformation you adopt in the unligand form of the enzyme. So this is now a bit more complex. So this is basically where the glycine and threonine are located. And so here in cyan, you have ligand-free forms of the enzyme. And in dark blue, you have ligand-bound forms of the enzyme in complex with uh, vanadate and tungstate. And so what you see is that for the ligand-bound forms of the enzyme, again, you get this overlap and you get the same closed conformation. But what's interesting is that in the wild type, obviously in the ligand-free form of the enzyme, you sample an open conformation, but you have this population shift to a closed conformation when you have ligand-bound with just a simple point mutation on the WPD loop. Now, it's not just a conformational shift, which you see from crystal structures, because the other thing that's really interesting with these point mutations is that the point mutations shift the kinetic PKA uh, so of the active site cysteine. So you see the differences in the pH rate profiles of the mutants compared to the well type enzyme but they don't alter the thermodynamic PKA. And this typically happens if conformational dynamics or some other similar feature is playing an important role. We use simulations to try to understand where these differences are coming from. And there are differences in inter interaction networks between the wild type and mutant enzymes. But primarily it seems to be that this uh, substitution simultaneously destabilizes the open form of the enzyme favoring the closed conformation while further stabilizing the closed conformation of the enzyme. And so again, loop dynamics, this is just one example, but uh, especially if you go and look at tin barrel proteins, uh, which are very catalytic catalytically diverse and active site loops play a major role. You can really see many examples of loop dynamics playing important evolutionary roles. But so then the question is, how can you actually use this in uh, enzyme design? And so I promised camp eliminases, and so here are camp eliminases. And so the idea here, this is a collaboration with Jose Manuel Sanchez Ruiz and his colleagues at the University of Granada. And the idea was that if you look at enzyme evolution, most studies of enzyme evolution focus on how existing active sites diverge and gain new catalytic functionalities, which is great because this is how the vast majority of new enzyme functions arise. But there are at least some percent of cases where you basically have catalytic activity that emerges completely de novo on scaffolds that were previously non-catalytic. Now, the opposite is more common that an enzyme loses catalytic residues and stops being a catalyst and takes other protein functions. But for example, there are examples of solute binding proteins that have evolved to become enzymes. And again, in these cases, conformational dynamics played an important role. And so the simplest way Jose hypothesized that you could actually achieve this was through a simple substitution of a hydrophobic to an ionizable amino acid side chain with catalytic functionality. And so the idea was, could you do that? And in particular, could you do that on a precambrian enzyme scaffold identified through ancestral sequence reconstruction? Because precambrian scaffolds tend to be both more thermostable and more evolvable, so better starting points if you want to generate new chemistry. And so basically, we examined uh, ancestrally uh, reconstructed beta lactamases covering a vast span of evolutionary time and sequence space, focusing primarily on this lineage leading from the PNCA nodes to the modern enterobacteria. And so if you look at these enzymes, one of the things that you see is that even though there's uh, quite a vast variation in sequence, structurally, these enzymes, if you compare a modern and an ancestral beta lactamase, they're relatively similar. So they overlay with low RMSD. But if you then look at conformational exchange contributions from NMR, so these are residues uh, with uh, shown as red spheres with large conformational exchange contributions from NMR, you see that the flexibility of the scaffold varies quite a lot comparing the ancestral to the modern enzyme. Now, we were looking for a good candidate for hydrophobic to ionizable amino acid substitution where you can generate a novel active site. And if you look here, there's a tryptophan buried in a tightly packed hydrophobic pocket on the opposite face from the actual original beta lactamase degrading active site, which is on the other side of the enzyme. And as you can see, the regions around it, particularly these helices, are much more, uh, basically, there are many more residues with high conformational exchange contributions in the ancestral scaffold than in the modern scaffold. And it was gratifying that it's a tryptophan, 
because in terms uh, of sterics and chemical properties, of course, the tryptophan side chain is very similar to the substrate for chemical elimination, which historically has been a really important model system for the design of both biological and synthetic catalysts for a range of reasons. So chemical elimination is, of course, considered the prototype reaction for setting base catalyzed proton abstraction from carbon. It's completely anthropogenic, so you don't have to worry about contamination from other naturally occurring enzymes. It's a relatively fast reaction, and of course, if you want to design it in a catalyst, you're not going to start with the most challenging uncatalyzed reaction you can get your hands on. And even though this, is, this was really just a proof of concept rather than a competition who can design the best catalysts, there is this added bonus that because people have been studying these enzymes so extensively, so, or basically uh, the novel catalysts for chemical elimination, there's a lot of data to compare to if you want to benchmark the performance of your catalysts against previous designs. And so the idea there was then if you take this tryptophan side chain and you substitute it with, say, an aspartic acid, so that can do the proton abstraction, will you be able to accommodate now both the aspartic acid side chain and the substrate for chemical elimination in this de novo binding pocket, bearing in mind that, of course, you now need to have at least some breathability because you need to fit two things, where before you just had to fit in the tryptophan side chain. But you also don't want too much flexibility because otherwise it won't bind and stay put. And will you get campylaminase activity? And will you, as a bonus, maybe get esterase activity, which has similar requirements for efficient catalysis? And uh, one thing is that chemical elimination, even though it's a very popular reaction because it's fast, is actually fairly hard to catalyze chemical elimination for two reasons. And uh, the first is the geometric similarity between the ground and the transition states. And the second is also that, yes, sure, you're building up negative charge, but this charge is heavily delocalized into the aromatic ring. So it's very hard to use electrostatic stabilization, for example, through an oxyanion hole. So it's actually not as trivial as it would look to design catalysts for chemical elimination. But nevertheless, so the modern beta-lactamases that uh, we studied in this work, especially from uh, Tem1 from E. coli and uh, this uh, Bacillus liquiniformis, which I'm sure I just brutalized the pronunciation of. So these show no campylaminase activity. Um, so also in the case of Tem1, there was no evidence of substrate binding, even though they retained beta-lactamase activity with uh, tryptophan to aspartic acid substitution. So it's not that the protein didn't fold or did something catastrophic. And again, we saw in our simulations as well that these are fairly highly specialized rigid, uh, quote, active sites or binding pockets. So the substrate just flies out after some tens of nanoseconds of simulation. But we did, however, observe catecholaminase activity at all the Precambrian nodes with varying degrees of activity, which again, through simulation and also just looking at B factors from the crystal structures, and you can track flexibility of the scaffold with activity with uh, basically the best activity being observed at this GNCA node, where we observe uh, efficient camp eliminase and ester hydrolase activities at both pH 7 and 8.2, while at the same time uh, retaining the ability to degrade both benzyl penicillin and cefotaxim in the original active site. And so we, uh, our colleagues saw crystal structures of uh, some of these beta-lactamases, and this is an overlay of the most probable beta-lactamase of the GNCA nodes, uh, GNCA MP, and the most catalytically efficient beta-lactamase of the GNCA node, just GNCA4 for its ranking. It has one additional stabilizing mutation. And essentially, I mentioned there, was, uh, there were a lot of residues with high conformational exchange contributions on these helices, which uh, also seem to be displaced in uh, the, these beta-lactamases. But you can see that the transition state analog binds in the de novo binding pocket beautifully aligned uh, with this aspartic acid side chain. And the goal here, again, it was not a competition who can design the best beta-lactamase, but rather a proof of concept. But still, gratifyingly, if you compare these beta-lactamases, and these are like other ancestrally reconstructed proteins, really highly thermostable proteins. So what you see is that our ancestral beta-lactamases converted to camp eliminases show both catalytic efficiencies and turnover numbers for camp eliminase activity using an extremely simple minimalist design that basically are comparable to or better than most prior camp eliminase designs and that aren't too far off the best camp eliminase design to date, which is the outcome of 17 rounds of directed evolution and an iterative design background. So that was really nice as a proof of concept study, also highlighting the importance of uh, both looking at conformational dynamics in the design process, but also, again, this was one of the earlier studies to really push forward this idea that you can use ancestral scaffolds for protein design. And it was also one of the first studies to go to these really ancient nodes. And 
Okay, great. So I have 10 minutes left. So hopefully I can get the last bits done very quickly. I just want to show you a quick optimization of the activity and I'm going to accelerate. So there's time for discussion. And so the question is, can you basically bridge that gap to HG317, this amazing camp eliminase? And can you do it without having to do a massive directed evolution? Because of course with directed evolution, you're very likely to improve the activity substantially. And so computationally rational design is, was a big flop for the very simple reason that this thing is already so optimized to bind the tryptophan that nothing really improves activity further. And random library screening was also a relative flop as you'd kind of expect. So of greater than 500 tested variants, the majority didn't even fold properly with greatly diminished activity. And the best of these had six mutations, but was only twofold more active in terms of KCAT over KM and the wild type. And so, so, I mean, we have in-house tools like Caddy, which basically mimic the process of directed evolution. So one idea would have been to do automated screening using Caddy, and we did this in another case. So you can actually screen a fairly large number of variants within not too terrible computational time. But again, the goal was to go for simple. Now, conveniently at this point, uh, I was in touch with Sarah Fleischmann over completely unrelated stuff. Um, Sarah told me about their new web server, Funklib. And Funklib, I can just say, is really awesome. So Funklib is basically a, a tool for evolutionary-based design that combines uh, evolutionary analysis with protein folding stability calculations using Rosetta. And so essentially, it's uh, you can uh, feed up to 15 hotspots, so it's user controlled where you actually randomize, so, and you can look at multi point variants at once, which helps with issues with epistasis. And so the thing with Funklib is it has no information about the transition state. So uh, we didn't get very good correlation between Funklib scores and turnover numbers, but still it's really powerful for predicting variants that are likely to improve activity while sticking to regions of uh, sequence space that are not going to be catastrophic for folding stability. And and so even though we didn't have amazing uh, correlations between uh, activity and functive score, so we randomized 11 positions, got 3,000 variants, and uh, my colleagues tested the top 20 experimentally. And within that top 20, we had four variants for this really challenging system with significantly improved activity over wild type at both pH 7 and 8.4. And of these, the best of these showed uh, KCAT over KM and KCAT values comparable to the catalytic efficiency of the average modern enzyme towards its natural substrate. And significantly, this was gained through improvements in KCAT, not just KCAT over KM. I'm sorry, not just KM, which is much more typical. And so it's not as good as AG317, but it was a really simple design strategy and very impressive that Funclip performs so well on the de novo active site because Funclip is basically using evolutionary information. So you'd expect it to be much better on a natural active site. And so then moving forward, we were trying to understand where these differences come from. And if you solve uh, crystal structures for these best variants, in one case with a transition state analog for comparison to the wild type, which also has a transition state analog, you see how well the scaffolds overlay. And there's really no major active site rearrangements. So it's basically minimal movement of active site side chains. We tried to screen with the EVB to see if we could basically further fine tune and rank variants based on activation free energies. The differences here are very small and unsurprisingly, we get better results with crystal structures than with computationally predicted structures. But in theory for systems where you have large differences, you could further refine uh, Funclip scores with EVB so you don't have to test thousands of variants experimentally. But what was kind of cool from our EVB simulations is uh, it seems that the improvements in activity are primarily coming from something very simple. And so if you look at the alignment of the reacting fragments, so this is partic acid side chain versus the substrate and the donor acceptor distance and the DHA angle, basically the closer to linearity this is and the closer to the donor acceptor distance, it seems the better the calculated activation free energy with pretty good correlations. Less good with, to experiment, but uh, again, we weren't reproducing experimental values so well because the energy differences are so small. But actually, reasonable correlations also to the experimental log KCAT over KM. And so it really seems to be that what's happening here is that you get these improvements in camp eliminase activity simply by improving the geometric pre-organization of the Michaelis complex. And why this is interesting is because this aspartic acid is in a floppy loop. So in principle, loop engineering, if you can rigidify that loop and put this aspartic acid into a catalytically ideal conformation, that's of course easier said than done. That could be one way that you could further boost the activity. And being mindful that I'm running narrow, uh, sorry, running short on time. 
So what drives enzyme evolution? We've been doing comparative enzymology on a huge range of systems. And of course, there are many other people working in this field as well. And unsurprisingly, you get strong correlations between structural and electrostatic features of enzyme active sites and variations in their substrate selectivity. There is really no one size fits all explanation because there are many features that are very system specific, but conformational dynamics seems to be a common feature. So enzymes, uh, of course, are just molecules. They don't have a plan. So they don't know in advance what's going to bind, but uh, they adjust their active sites once the substrate's bound to a given substrate after the binding step, of course, sacrificing specific binding interactions to do so. And uh, loop dynamics particularly seems to play an important role. So loops are not just lids, but they actually seem to be regulating turnover in quite a lot of different enzymes. And this seems to be an important factor in allowing for new enzyme activities to emerge both during natural and directed evolutionary trajectories. And so we posit that this is a feature that needs to be accounted for in both computational and uh, uh, experimental protein engineering studies. And it's really nice to see more and more studies in the literature that are starting to do so. And so obviously I've just focused on a, a small subset of our work here. We have two reviews from last year, which also discusses uh, discuss quite a lot of work of others. In case you're interested, this is a fast moving field. So it feels like already a review from mid last year is a bit out of date, but at least this is the state of the art of the field from a year ago. And there've been other really nice reviews by others since. And so there are many people I want to thank. So uh, great collaborators for sharing their expertise, experimental data and insights. And again, in particular, Danny, who really shaped the way I think. Multiple sources uh, of funding and support. My wonderful research team. This is a uh, slightly old picture, as you can imagine, from the fact that uh, we're all hanging out or they're all hanging out in Tallinn. I really hope that uh, we can all see each other in person again soon and do social activities again. And I really wish I could have been in Oxford today. And then, of course, the biggest thanks to the organizers for inviting me to be here today and for all of you for staying till the end of the day to listen. It's really great giving this talk and I'm looking forward to your questions. Well, thanks very much, Lynn, for a really fascinating talk on, on as you have said, a, a very fast moving and exciting field. So we've time for questions. Please put them in the q and I'll, I'll start with, with one. Um, I mean, really fascinating the way you're using metadynamics to explore this conformational, uh, conformational dynamics. How, how long do these runs, metadynamics runs, need to be in order to explore the uh, conformational dynamics? Is it several nanoseconds? Uh, more like several hundred. So typically between, five, so it depends on two things. One is how complex the loop is. So of course, if you have a much longer floppier loop, that's kind of, uh, if you have conformational dynamics within the loop as well, and not just loop motion, of course, then the runs need to be longer. And the other is also how well you define your collective variables. So yeah. if you can cleverly define collective variables, then of course uh, the simulations will converge more quickly. But if I remember off the top of my head, what I see from my group is that for this kind of dynamic typically between 500 nanoseconds to microseconds to get uh, reasonable data with diffusive behavior. Yeah, so it's very computationally intensive. Exactly. So I remember talking to colleagues and we were discussing computational resources and they couldn't believe how much we actually need to use to make this happen. But based on what I just said, you see why we need tens of millions of core hours, right? Yeah, <laughs> certainly can see that. Uh, and really fascinating how this conformational dynamics is a key component of uh, of enzyme evolution. Is is that now a generally accepted uh, concept? I think within, so as you probably recall, there was huge debate about uh, whether conformational dynamics is catalytically important. But I think at least within the enzyme evolution community, uh, it seems to be a fairly non-controversial statement by now. It took a long time. So, I mean, the idea was initially put forward by Danny in 2003, and he presented this quote, new view of uh, enzyme catalysis. And uh, it probably took off in the mid 2010s, but by now it's I don't think there's so many people who would complain if I say that, let's put it like that. Okay, so now there's a question come in on the Q&A from Constantinus, who says, in the loop dynamics, how long is the loop that moves in PTP? And by, by how many angstroms is its maximum displacement? Is there a threshold which may cause denaturing of the enzyme? 
So I think it's a pretty flexible loop. So it seems to be fairly stable. It's uh, by measuring key distances. So I'm not sure if you were to look at the full RMSD over all the loop residues, but if you look at uh, key distances, it seems to be in the seven to nine Ohmstrom range, depending on the loop when going from open to fully closed. But then if you go to these hyper open confirmations, my postdoc Rory can answer this question better, but that's more along the lines of 10 to 15 Ohmstrom. So it's a relatively large loop movement, and uh, both in PTPs and also in the prior work in triosphosphate isomerase, we see that it's also not a two-state motion. So you basically sample multiple open conformations of the loop, and these interconvert with each other. So it seems a lot of the search space uh, is just the enzyme sampling between different open conformations and interconversion within the loop before it finds a closed conformation. For both TIM and for PTP, Piece. What we do see, though, is that even though the open confirmation has multiple metastable states, there is a very, very narrowly defined catalytically competent closed confirmation so that you have to get to if you really want to vision activity. Okay, thanks very much. We've probably time for another question, if anyone has one. I can't see any more in the Q&A. Well, if not, could I just thank you again, Lynn, for an excellent talk and could I thank both you and Alex for giving us such a such a really interesting and varied session so thanks very much uh, before we finish I just would like to draw your attention to the fact that nominations are now open for the John Myrick Thomas medal which is awarded by the catalysis hub it, it alternates it's awarded each year alternating between an early career catalytic scientist and a mid-career catalytic scientist. So we would this year very much welcome nominations from an early career, for an early career uh, scientist. And Corinne has just put um, the link to the details uh, in, in the chat. So please do think of making nominations for this, for this medal. Okay, well, I think that's probably all. And thank you everyone for attending. Thanks again to our speakers, both this morning and this afternoon. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.